today, I want to get right into it. I want, I want to talk about God's heart. About eight years ago, I became all the more familiar with the heart, like the heart that each one of us has in our bodies. Well acquainted, my son Jackson, who is eight, was born, and immediately he had heart problems. They noticed something, they whisked him away. Many of you heard this story, and I learned some things. Your heart has four chambers. I don't know if you knew that. Four chambers, a wall of muscle separates the two, and that was what Jackson, he had a hole in that that muscle that's separating the two um, uh, top chambers in his heart. The upper chambers are called atria, or I heard atrium, but we have an atrium at our at our campus here, so I don't know if that's the right um, uh, word. So I'm going to say atria. And the lower chambers, chambers, anybody know what they're called? Ventricles. Ventricles, that's right. They're down below. Four chambers, okay? And Jackson, my son, had problems with his atria, meaning the hole was there. And then he also had a narrowed valve in his uh, one of his ventricles, and it required heart surgery um, at four months old. Luckily, it wasn't the invasive kind of heart surgery, and so they went up through his groin. Um, he'll never be the same. And, um, and they went up through a vein or an artery and um, they did the surgery, and he is better now. So, But I learned about these four chambers of the heart. Today, I want to talk to you about the heart of God for our church in 2020. And when I asked him the question this week, what do you want me to tell these people? What do you want me to speak about your heart? He gave me four areas, four focuses, four chambers. So we're going to talk about the four chambers of God's heart for us in 2020. And I thought we'd jump right into, I think, the main one, Simon Sinek, an author. Um, he spoke a few years at our Global Leadership Summit that we do every August. He says, start with the why. And so we're going to start with the why, why we exist in that first chamber of God's heart that I want you uh, to know about and be reminded of is our mission. And this is the mission that God has given to one church. Habakkuk 2.2, 2, Habakkuk is a real book in the real Bible. It's just a mouthful. Habakkuk 2.2 2 says this, write the vision and make it clear. Is anybody excited when the main thing is the main thing and it's simple? I love it when the most important thing is simple. Write the vision, make it clear so that anyone can read it quickly. It's not complicated. When we asked the Lord a few years ago, what's the mission of one church? I love that he gave us something simple and, and, and certainly something straight from his word. That, that other verse, uh, another translation says, so that he who reads it can run, can go, can get on with it, can do something, can be somebody. It's simple. I, um, I love this verse. And our mission here at One Church, you probably see it different places, is to make disciples. And there, how do we do that? We, we have three words. You see these words all over too. Connect, grow, make a difference. You know, they're in print. They're on the walls. Just different things. Connect, grow, make a difference. But it, all that is just the pattern of being a disciple and helping others to become disciples. To make disciples. That's our mission. And, and here's what happened, though. That was like seven years ago that we felt like God gave us that mission from his word. Um, some of Jesus' last words to his disciples before he ascended into heaven where he waits for us one day to spend an eternity with him. He, he told us to make disciples. But, but here's the thing. I have come to the conclusion that that is incomplete. That, that's half of the mission. And so this may be the day in which we go on record to say our mission has changed. Our mission 2.0. And this is what I want to give to you today. The mission of One Church 2.0. And it's this. I believe our complete mission is to make disciples who make disciples. Because that says something additional and I think altogether different. To make disciples who make disciples. It's a never-ending process. We believe people, or we are people collectively who connect, grow, and make a difference and help others to do the same. We, we talk about this in one track, that hey, now that you've gone through one track, invite somebody else to come through one track and help them get connected to the mission of God that is part of this community of believers. Help others do the same. You know, everybody is a disciple, but everybody is also a discipler. And this is what I want to call out of us today. Because I think some of us, um, you know, you're here today, and maybe some of you, you would say, I'm not even a follower of Jesus. 
I like saying that better than a Christian because we have a lot of um, ideas of what a, a Christian is like in our world today. But a follower of Jesus, that's a little clearer. Someone who's living their life after the central person of humanity, Jesus Christ. The central person of history. That's different. Following after that guy. Everybody um, is on a journey of becoming a disciple. And if you're here today and you're not there yet, I, I want to say welcome. You're in a, in a good place and and it's between you and the Lord, that timeline. I just want to give you a thumbs up that you're here. Some of you, though, you, you, you've become a disciple of Jesus. You follow Jesus. And you're like, okay, you just said something else. You're saying to me that I'm not supposed to just be a disciple, but I'm also supposed to be a discipler. And the answer is yes. And more on that in a second. But to the first part of that, the disciple part, let me ask you a question. And I'm going to ask you a lot of questions today because I, I feel like um, today I'm supposed to challenge you with questions, to ask you to look deep and evaluate yourself. Are you a growing disciple? Whether you've been a a follower of Jesus for a short time or for a long time, are you a growing disciple? That's why it's called followers of Jesus, because he's actually alive and he moves. He moves over here and he's doing this thing, and then he moves over here and he's doing that thing. And if we are growing, then we're actually following. And if we're not growing, we're just staying still. Another question, have you stopped or slowed following Jesus. And then that second side, the, not just the disciple, but the s- discipler, are you making disciples in your life? And if you aren't, this is a challenging statement, if you aren't, are you really a disciple? Because as I read the Word of God, I don't see the separation. And I could put Scripture after Scripture in front of you that says, from infancy in, the, in your following of Jesus to maturity or whatever that looks like, many few years, many years, we are called to be both disciples and disciplers. The church is a resource in this, but not the answer in this. Many people say, well, that's the church's job and the leaders of the church. They're the ones that should be making disciples. Let me tell you something. You are the answer. The church is not the answer. The church is a community. Here we are, a community of us, a community. It's not a building. We've, we've, we've stopped. It's not an organization. We, we have a, a wrong mentality. The church is a community, not a building, that, mo- that most often gathers in a building. I think here we are, but it's a community who encourages and challenges disciplers. That's what the church is all about. I- I'll tell you, I'll prove it to you in a second. If it's okay, there's a scripture coming, but let me ask you another few questions. When was the last time you shared your faith with somebody? And can I just tell you, it'll look different for every single one of you. Don't look across the aisle or even across the house at how somebody else would do it. You don't have to share your faith on a box or on a street corner with a sign on your neck. You know, you don't have to do it like somebody else. Do it like you. Share your faith. Represent what God has done in you. And it's not that complicated. It doesn't have to be like, would you like to be saved? And that's the first thing out of your mouth. No. You can say, hey, you know, I noticed you're going through this. You know, my friend went through this. And I know that the church was a pretty big support to them in this time. Or, you know, you're, you're encountering this. We actually went through this same thing. And the big deal was like, the Lord really helped me through it. And, and then the family of God Help me through. And then all of a sudden, from your experience, your testimony, your story, you can help somebody. You can do it as casual or as in your face as you want. It's all up to you. When was the last time you invited somebody to church? I mean, I know a lot of you are here because somebody invited you. Praise God. But, you know, do you walk around looking for people, you know, at school, at, at work, um, in your neighborhood? to reach out and invite to church because here, you know, somebody's usually right here and there's a group up there and there's people praying and there's people in the classrooms. We're all ready to help you disciple people. But if you think we are the answer, not you, then we've missed the first and most powerful step in this whole process. It's you. Again, it will look different from each of us. It's not the job of a pastor. Je- let me, again, let me look at this. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He's talking to each one of us. He's not talking about a small group of people that are leading. Or interest. He's talking to us all. When was the last time you discipled somebody, you know, and, and you walked with them in their life, investing in them, showing them what it looks like to follow Jesus? And that can look as, as, as organized as in one of the ministries of our church, or it can look like just one-on-one, going to coffee or something. And you might say, again, that's not my job. That's a pastor's job. No. 
Look at Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. It says this. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. And it makes a list. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. But check out verse 12. Their responsibility, this group, is to equip God's people, that's us, to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. There it is. It's our job. And the church, the community, and the pastor, and all that stuff, the, the, the role of that person is to equip, to encourage, to challenge, to make it simpler, to inspire, to give you opportunity to actually be the body of Christ, for you to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. And oftentimes it's because we're just, well, I'm too busy, or I'm too this or too that. And I just want to, again, speak to that. You have to make room, and you need to make room for the mission of Christ in your life, to be on mission for him. We read this quote a lot because it's just so good. Brady Boyd, a pastor and author in his book, Addicted to Busy, he says this, maybe the good Samaritan, you know that story in the Bible that Jesus told about somebody that took the time to help somebody. He says this, maybe the good Samaritan didn't wake up that morning thinking, I believe I'll hunt for an outreach opportunity today. But he had the margin to offer to God. He had left enough margin in his schedule, in his spending patterns, and in his soul that he could be used in a missional way. This hardly computes in a Western mind. How can we be expected to do something for somebody else when we can barely do what our own lives demand? Whenever we've passed by needs, it's generally been because we've been too busy or too broke or too at odds somehow in our inner world. Man, that's good. Our mission is to make disciples who make disciples. This is our why. This is why one church exists. I want to give you three practical things for disciples and disciplers today to help you live this out, to walk this out in community. And the first is this. Get involved in a group. We have groups of all kinds at one church. You can go to visitonechurch.com slash groups. You can see them all. There's groups that meet at home. There's groups that meet here at the church. There's groups that go out there and do something. There's groups that study the Bible. There's all kinds. Just go on that. Even now, you can go on and check it out. And, and, and why do we have groups? So people can connect and in particular grow. They can connect one to another. They can ultimately connect to God. Um, but then they can grow too. Secondly, get involved in a ministry. I spoke of this a little earlier, but, I mean, do something with the time and the talent that God has given you. Like, you are uniquely wired to make an impact that no one else can do. And, and when you get involved in the ministry, you're going to connect because you'll connect with the team that you're ministering alongside of. But you'll also be making a difference. Again, some of those core values of our church. And then number three, become part of Kingdom Builders. And there's all kinds of ministries rescuing the victims of, of human trafficking, um, being first responders when there's a natural disaster around our world, church planting to unreached people groups. It's powerful um, in our in our auditoriums at each campus. There's, there's a Kingdom Builders kiosk. Go check that out. There's a seatback card right in front of you. But here's the deal. Become part of Kingdom Builders if you're not already a part. If you have been a part, then consider increasing what you do through Kingdom Builders so that you can in the, in the fact that the Lord's blessed you further, you can be a blessing to others. Um, this is also that people can have the opportunity to connect, grow, and make a difference in our community that aren't here today and all around the world. We want them to be disciples. So that first chamber is our mission 2.0. The second chamber is this of God's heart. It's the Go Fundamental. Many of you may have been here a few weeks ago, and I talked about Go in a message called Go, a Living Sacrifice and, and, and again, if you didn't see that message, you need to go to visitonechurch.com slash go, and you can access the link there. It's an important message that I'm asking everyone in our church that calls our church their home to go there. And I, I read a scripture to you. Romans 12.1 says, therefore, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, because of all that he's done, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Can you say those words with me again? Living sacrifice, one, two, three. Living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What we do in our services, singing songs, that's worship. But like there's a higher level of worship, a lifestyle level of worship that God says, this is what it boils down to. You are a living sacrifice. You are the gift. You know, it's not what you give financially or even your time, your t it's you. You are the thing that God wants the most. All of you, your heart, you are the gift. And I believe that God is calling each of us to go. Or to say it a little differently, to a go lifestyle. And again, this is going to look very different for each one of us. 
And I don't want to water down that word go by saying go lifestyle. Um, Some of you, God's actually challenging your location in life to be changed so that he can do something different with you and with your family. He's calling you to go. Let me tell you something. You are called to adventure. You are made for adventure. You've got it in you. Some of you, you you look at yourself and you're like, oh, they've got it in them, but I don't have it in me. False. You've got adventure in you. You have something unique to offer this world that nobody else can do. And I'm here today to call the next level of adventure out of you for the next season. Some of you, you've got a change on the horizon. And God is saying that change is to make space for adventure for me. Not for you. Not for what you thought, for me. And in that, you're going to find so much happiness and fulfillment for you and for yours. You are the gift. God, uh, going is where the living sacrifice starts. And you can go in a lot of ways, as I mentioned. You fill in the blank for you, but this second chamber really is God is calling all of us to go in unique and distinct ways. What, what, where, how is he calling you to go today? The third chamber, two more. The third chamber of God's heart is a strategy of multiplication. Look, we are a different kind of church. Some of you that have been a part of church a long time, you're like, this is a weird church and that is a weird dude up there. I, I, I get it, okay? Um, we are very, very different and we do weird things. We are a church that actually feels like we don't need to get bigger and bigger at one location, but we can get, we can get wider. I don't know if that's the better way to say it. Healthier, um, I'm after the word that says healthier, by spreading out to multiple locations, and I want to talk about that in just a second. We have nine congregations, um, seven locations, going on seven locations all around the Central Valley, but we will never be a church that's ready to multiply locations if we don't multiply leaders. Everyone has influence, you have influence, and leadership is influence, and therefore, everybody's a leader. Nobody, somebody may not have ever called you a leader. I'm here to say you are a leader. And you have the ability to influence somebody someplace. And God wants to give you that today and tomorrow circle for you to be that person of influence in somebody's life. And so we do things like the Global Leadership Summit, and we give other opportunities for people to grow. The Global Leadership Summit comes on in August on the 2nd, uh, Thursday and Friday. Uh, put it on your radar. Um, put it on your calendar today and invite somebody to come with you. But another real practical way I want you to know about is we have a school of leadership here at One Church. And um, there's two main sides of our school of leadership. One is our One Church internship. This is for people that feel called into ministry or missions. And we have eight interns that are part of the school uh, of our internship. And then in addition to that, um, we have our next level leadership. And this is people from the age of 17 all the way, I think, to 50, 55 people. We have a pretty big um, cross-section. My wife, Marcia, she leads our school of leadership. And every Thursday they gather, they grow as leader. There's some teaching time. And then they engage in ministry here in the context of our church. And so this is for a group of people that maybe you say, I don't feel called to be a pastor or a missionary or what have you, but I feel like I'm supposed to be a leader. And I feel like I'm supposed to make a difference at an additional level than the average volunteer is able the Next Level Leadership Program is for you. You can go get more information at visitonechurch.com slash OCSL. All right. Where am I? Back to the campuses thing. Um, we can do the campus thing if we do the leadership thing well. Because ultimately, the reason that we've planted a campus, many people ask, what's the strategy? When do you say yes to an opportunity to adopt a, a church into your family uh, uh, of campuses into the one church family or when do you say yes to um, planting and the answer is when a leader walks into our life and we feel like God's saying they are too good to sit on the bench someplace they need to be starting someplace else and that's not just the pastor like I've seen it with our church planting and our adopting that all of a sudden people like you that were just um, in some ways filling a seat here all of a sudden we're like what you play drums what are you doing? And all of a sudden when we adopt or we plant a campus, a person that has a hidden skill or they've always wanted to be involved in an area like that says, you know what, I'll take that step because I feel like it's, uh, it's a needed thing or I'm needed. And it's powerful. I mean, the, the, the church planting idea has not just been about um, the, the, the lead pastor, the campus pastor, or the, the, the worship person. It's been about everybody, people that can shake hands, people that can love families and, and kids. And it's, it's an incredible thing. So there's been less of a strategy strategy in this than you think. This is one of the things you're like, man, this is a weird place. It's true. This is a weird place. Um, 
what's the simple strategy? I think we just say yes when God tells us to say yes. And there have been three or four opportunities when someone from the areas walked in, and I, I prayed, and I either said, no, I don't feel like this is the right thing. Pastor, I love you, and I want to help you. There's other things that we can do, but we don't feel like it's time for you to be a part of one church. Because I think there's a lot of folks who say, you know, do we just say yes to everybody? And the answer is no, we can't. Uh, or we say, yes, but not right now. Can we talk in a year? Things like that. And it, all this is because we don't think that you have to get bigger and bigger and bigger at one location. We also think we want to see people that are called of God step into that new level of calling. Um, and here's the, the big idea, and I want to invite Pastor Anthony up to the stage. If you would come with open hands, resources, and people, we share of what God has freely shared with us. That is our heart, and that is a different kind of church. I can tell you something. I've been a part of a lot of churches, and I know that they're out there, but most of the churches that I've been a part of, if I speak honestly to you, we do this with resources and people. The pastor says, oh, don't go anywhere. All of you stay. Stay with us. We're a family. And it's true. I want you to stay. I love you. I love that you're here. But at the same time, when somebody like this, who you've begun to meet, walks into our, walks into our life, man, I know that God's called them, and that means God's called people to partner with him. And so you've met Pastor Anthony. Um, pastor Anthony and his wife, Laura, who's also a pastor, they are called to start a church, a campus in Manteca. And this will be our seventh location, One Church Manteca. Many of you have heard this vision a couple times over. But in a second, I want to give you an opportunity to speak. But as I talk about Manteca, or as you've heard him preach over the last couple times, if there was something that just in your heart, just like there was like a a lightning bolt or something that went off, that could be God's Spirit speaking to you about participating either in the short term or long term in this, this campus launch, maybe joining the Manteca campus. Um, and listen, I say this, I hope this sounds okay so coming out. Like, I don't own you. And this campus doesn't own you. And you're probably like, you better, better be right that you don't, or whatever, you know. But, like, at the end of the day, there's a lot of churches that, that they operate differently. And I'm here to say, I want, if God is speaking to you, to create a doorway so that I can say to you, hey, here's some people that God would entrust to you. They're not yours. They're his. But for this season, they want to be a part of what God has put on your heart. And so if you feel something in your heart towards that. Here's how you act on that. Come talk to me or Marcia. Come talk to one of your campus pastors um, so that we can be engaged and informed. That's really important. We want to celebrate the whole process, and we want to be able to introduce you if you don't know Pastor Anthony and Laura. Um, and some of you do know them, and, and we want to just wide open the doors to, to you and them. But ultimately, we want to walk this process like a family because we celebrate that. Would you just take just a short moment and explain to people how they can get more information about this? Sure, absolutely. Um, if you take a look at the screen, this is a picture of my family right here. My wife couldn't be here this morning. That is my actual wife. That's not a model <laughs> that I paid. We're actually, I'm actually married to that woman. She's gorgeous and amazing. And that's my son Luke right there. Um, and we are planning a church in Manteca. And we, we actually had our first meeting this week. Uh, there were 11 of us piled into our house. Uh, we worshiped, and I got to tell you, man, the Spirit of God moved so heavy in worship. I found myself just sobbing, just sobbing, just sensing the spirit of, of revival that was on this group. And so I'm just really excited about this. Um, real quick, there's a lot of ways to get involved in what we're doing. Maybe you're like, I'm called to this campus, but I'm, I am part of one church, and I want to support you guys in any way that I can. And, and maybe you don't have the capacity to come with us, but you can partner with us in prayer. Um, go ahead and sign up for our prayer team. And it's real simple. You just text prayer team to 31996, and that will sign you up for our prayer team. And I'm sending out um, information every month on ways that you guys can pray for us. Right now we're looking for a facility. Um, and it's, it's just tough finding a property where, um, where we want to be. And so if you would, just, just pray with us about that. Um, that's a huge prayer need right now. But then there's a, a, another way that you can join us. If you feel like God is stirring you and you're like, man, I just, I hear your heart and I, I feel the sense the Holy Spirit is calling me to go. Um, if that's you, I just want to encourage you, text launch team to 31996. What this is going to do, um, it's going to send you a text back that says, hey, thanks for joining our launch team. Look. I ignore that for a second. Um, all we're wanting to do is capture your information, and this is the best way to do it so that I can reach out to you. If you are at all interested 
um, and you text launch team. This is not you signing up, but this is just a way for us to um, get your information so that we can contact you and um, be in conversation with you about that. And if the Lord's stirring you at all, I just want to encourage you, go ahead and text that. It'll send you a link, and you can um, find out a little bit more information about that. So, I want you to hear from me that we believe in you, and I believe in you. And I'm so g- glad that you've said yes to going, um, and we're behind you. So could you guys give it up? Well, thank you. Pastor Anthony. So a strategy of multiplication was that third chamber. And then finally, and I'm going to have uh, our band make ready as we prepare to respond to this, um, that fourth chamber of God's heart is the presence and the spirit. I believe that the presence of God changes things. I believe God can do one, uh, more in one minute in his presence then it might take us six, I mean, it's even funny to put a number on this, six months, ten months, twelve months, any amount of time, God can do something like that that took us this many hours of counseling or this many conversations or this many things, uh, fill in the blank. I think that we have underestimated the importance of God's presence and thus every moment that we possibly could spend in it. We want to be a church that goes after the Lord in his presence. And every Sunday there's an opportunity not just to do that from your seat, but also to take a step out of your seat and respond. And something amazing happens when we we fill the front of a room of worship and prayer and praying for one another. Don't underestimate those steps. And then secondly, just that spirit we're talking about the move of God's spirit, there's a couple scriptures that came to mind. Joel 2 says, I will pour, this is God talking out, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. That covers everybody. Young and old, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. I don't know about you, but like, I want to see God do something crazy awesome. And that means we've got to start praying like that. We've got to start pursuing like that. We start start realizing that there is another level that we need in the Spirit of God and in our relationship with God. Another level of freedom, 2 Corinthians 3.17 says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and we sang this earlier, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's freedom, there's help, there's health for whatever it is that you're going through. We want to see God's Spirit move. This could look a bunch of different ways, but it could look like people being healed emotionally, physically, spiritually. We want to see prophetic words, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. If you read um, in in the book of Corinthians, you can read all this. The, The gift of faith and discernment active in our midst. We want to have a hunger to respond anytime that we can to the Word of God being preached. Let me ask you a question, because I've asked this, you know, in today's culture where you can watch this church online or this church online or even you that are watching online, I think it's awesome, and it's, it's, the, it's, the first, it's a better step than nothing at all to keep track of what's happening at your church when you're able to watch online when you can't be here. I love it, but there's something different over the digital airwaves than what we have responding in the midst of of God's presence in the midst of worship, in the midst of His Spirit. And I want God to be moving like that so much so that like it's all the more reason to get here in our busy schedules, to get our families here, to want to get our children here. A hunger to respond. The presence in the Spirit was that fourth thing. So how do I wrap all this up? Those four things are God's heart. As I've heard Him speak it, as many of us are responsible to lead. We hear God speaking on those four things loud and clear for us. And there's probably other ways, but those feel like the main ones for this season. And what we're asking is, Lord, would your heart become our heart? Would what you want in these areas become what we want in these areas? The things that have God's heart, I want them to have my heart. The things that break God's heart, I want those very things to break my heart. And so today, would you ask the Lord to let his heart 
be your heart. And specifically as part of this family, would you say, you know what, I will get behind these four things that are in the heart of God, written in his word generally, and then spoken about specifically here at One Church. And I want to pray with you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's just take a moment. Lord, we want your heart. Lord, we want your heart more than we've ever wanted it, God. This is the day. Now is the time. We want the heart of God. And I want that heart of God to be evidenced in me. I want it to be so clearly seen that spouses and parents and children and nieces and nephews and friends and just everyone sees a difference, the heart of God evidenced in me. And so, Lord, I want your heart. Amen. Now we get a chance to respond a couple songs. Thank you, son. Um, A couple songs here. And I want to invite you. You can come as I am still talking. Join me in these altars. Or you can do that, a little altar, your your seat if you're shy or if you want to stay there. But, like, would you come and let's respond as we can say, Lord, we want your heart. We want all of your heart. So let's sing. Let's respond. It's hard. 